Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to uh, those of you um, who took the time out of their busy days to join us on this webinar. Um, as uh, Brad mentioned, we'll be focusing on um, isotherm uh, shape, isotherm modeling, what we can learn uh, once we obtain uh, the isotherm on our materials. So the um, this is a little bit busy slide, but it's just a just shows uh, I'm not going to get into um, how to measure an isotherm or what a DBS is or anything like that. Um, I'm going to start and jump right into getting the isotherm and uh, and, and going from there. So just for those not familiar, and a DBS is a gravimetric uh, system, so we measure the weight change. Um, on this graph, this red line, this solid red line is showing the weight change, and the uh, dotted uh, red or orange line is showing the relative humidity as a function of time on the x-axis. So typically what happens is the sample was dried, then exposed to increasing relative humidity steps, let's say from zero to 95% relative humidity in this particular example. And uh, ideally, the sample mass reaches equilibrium, which means it levels off. So if I give it long enough time, uh, or measure the slope and give it a slope criteria, that the sample will, will each reach equilibrium with the surrounding uh, vapor, in this case, it's water vapor, and then we'll move on to the next programmed uh, step. So from these equilibrium points, uh, we can construct what's called the isotherm. So the isotherm is plotted um, uh, on the uh, top uh, x-axis. So here we have uh, target relative humidity and percentage weight change. So the solid line is the absorption or increasing uh, relative partial pressure. And the dotted line is the desorption or decreasing relative partial pressure. And it's this isotherm um, and the absorption isotherm, the desorption isotherm, the shape, uh, the size, and also what's called the hysteresis, which if you look right here is the difference between the absorption isotherm and the desorption isotherm at a particular relative humidity. So the location, the size, and the shape, and the changing of this uh, hysteresis and shape of the isotherm can uh, give us a lot of information about how the particular vapor interacts with the material. In this case, we're just looking at a, a polymer film. It's a naphion proton exchange membrane, um, looking at moisture on, uh, moisture off uh, onto this particular sample. So, for those of you uh, familiar with isotherm uh, shapes and types, um, there is a classic uh, BDDT classification. There is a revised one uh, that shows more than this. I don't want to spend too much time um, going into the nitty gritty of these different isotherm shapes, um, only because most of them were developed uh, on um, rigid materials using nitrogen absorption under, temp under uh, vacuum and at cryogenic temperatures. So in a DVS, you may not see all of these isotherms. But uh, very briefly, this is what's called a type 1 or a Langmuir isotherm. Basically, uh, water comes on the surface or, I mean, or whatever vapor or gas comes on the surface, and that's it. What I will highlight is what's called a type 2 or type 4 isotherm. These have a traditional sigmoidal shape, and the knee, which is right here, what's called the knee of the isotherm, it is possible to uh, obtain a surface area from a monolayer capacity. So these two isotherms um, indicate that whatever gas or vapor forms a monolayer and then grows uh, subsequent layers from there. So. Um, I'll get into some models and what they mean and how they can be used, um, but please keep in mind that it is highly unlikely for real-world uh, composite materials or food materials or amorphous or polymer materials to show a pure isotherm like you see here. Um, sometimes I'm going to get a mixture of different isotherms because I have different components or different surface groups that behave differently. So. Um, and I did mention most of these things are um, developed and based on gas or surface absorption um, onto uh, rigid or highly crystalline materials. 
So here's an example of a quartz. So just think of uh, silica, uh, a quartz uh, sample. And this is an octane isotherm, um, which shows a very classic type two behavior. So you get a, a knee here in this sigmoidal shape. This is where the monolayer uh, or the first layer of uh, vapor forms on the surface. And then additional layers uh, uh, pile on as we go to further uh, higher relative vapor pressures. Um, here is a uh, what's called a type uh, 5 isotherm, where I get this um, capillary condensation effect due to mesoporosity. Mesoporosity is defined by the IUPAC as 20 to 500 angstroms or 2 to 50 nanometers. So this hysteresis gap is due to capillary condensation. And I will get into some examples of that uh, later on, but I just wanted to highlight um, this is on a uh, amorphous carbon sample. So not only uh, these two slides will show you that not only is the sample uh, a function of the isotherm, but also the chemistry of the molecule is a function of the isotherm. In traditional volumetric nitrogen absorption, the nitrogen doesn't have any chemistry. So it really is, is not um, indicating any surface chemistry or anything like that. Um, but the isotherm that's measured is a function of both the surface it's measured on and the adsorbate that's being used. So this is an example on a crystalline lactose sample where we have water, which is in this blue, which is uh, highly polar, and it is more of a type three behavior. And as we go from water to methanol, to ethanol, to propanol, to butanol, we make the molecule less polar by uh, making the alkane part longer. And we can see the isotherm shape changes as we go from a highly polar molecule to a less polar molecule like one butanol. So this is just to highlight um, and remind people that the isotherm is a function of both the solid that you're measuring and the vapor and or gas that you're using. So over the years, there have um, been developed a wide range of isotherm models. So once I get an isotherm, I can fit it to either an empirical or semi-empirical um, uh, or a fundamental model. Um, this is only a small selection of them. This is not all of them. Most of these, um, what I will call classic isotherm models, are typically uh, assuming surface sorption only. So when we think of nitrogen, nitrogen only typically will lie on the surface of a material. When we think of a DVS experiment, I can use water or ethanol or acetone or some other solvent where uh, the material might be partially, partially soluble in. So um, I have surface and bulk sorption. So a lot of these classic uh, equations, like the Langmuir equation, in particular the BET equation, only assume surface sorption, and that's important. So in a DVS uh, environment, these models are typically um, applied when I'm looking at what I will call a rigid material like a, 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 an oxide, alumina, silica, uh, activated carbon, um, things like that, or a highly crystalline material where the molecule of choice, let's say water, is only laying on the surface of the material and is not partially soluble in the material of interest. Um, when we're dealing with um, natural materials or amorphous materials or foodstuffs, um, these are very often, in particular with water, um, these materials will often get a significant amount of bulk absorption in addition to surface adsorption. Um, and that's pretty, pretty well understood. The, the bad news is that very often um, when I'm using water, on a, an amorphous uh, polymer or a protein or a food material, I can very often get this isotherm shape that'll have a very similar isotherm shape, if I go back, to this type two or sigmoidal isotherm. Keep in mind, this isotherm assumes surface absorption only. However, with um, a lot of natural 
or organic materials. Um, in particular, where water is partially soluble in, um, I can get this sigmoidal shape, but it is not due to surface absorption. Um, I get this knee, this plateau, and this upswing. And uh, the reason for that, in particular with amorphous materials, water can act as a very strong plasticizer. So when I'm below a critical relative humidity, uh, the material is in the glassy state, and I get a relatively slow uh, uptake. Then it can increase and go into this uh, uh, glass transition region where it's shifting from the glassy to the rubbery state. And then eventually I get this large upswing when it fully goes through and relaxes. Water increases molecular mobility. And um, then I can see that this uh, large uh, upswing um, here is due to it going from the glassy to the rubbery state. And for good or bad, I get this isotherm shape um, that may look like a surface absorption isotherm, but it's actually not. And that's due to the fact that, um, you know, the system itself, the material itself is uh, maybe not even in uh, equilibrium. So the material is changing. So the starting material is much different than the ending material. And I can, um, you know, um, there are uh, some ways uh, to model. These are more based off of um, uh, kind of polymer solvent isotherm uh, models. And um, here are a few of them that you uh, see uh, on, the, uh, on the screen here. I'm not going to go into uh, uh, detail into all of these, um, but I just want to uh, highlight the fact that many what I'll call real or real world, or in particular organic or natural materials or food-based or starch-based or cellulose-based materials can behave in a very complex and in fact dynamic um, mode uh, with water in particular, uh, or another solvent where it is highly soluble in. So um, for these type of materials, it's very difficult to um, use one model or one type of mechanism, water or the vapor of choice may be behaving in a very complex way and it may be changing throughout the experiment. So the um, uh, SMS does have a um, isotherm uh, suite to help analyze. Once I've collected an isotherm, we do have a, a range of um, the, <clears throat> Uh, a wide range of the kind of what I'll call classic isotherm models um, that are in the literature. So once I generate an isotherm, doesn't matter what instrument it is, doesn't matter what um, vapor or gas I'm using, um, then I can apply these models to try to elucidate mechanistic, mechanistic or structural information about the sample. So I'm gonna very briefly go through some of these models and um, tell you when and when they cannot be applied. So the most common one or the most commonly things that people are interested in typically is the BET surface area. As I mentioned previously, this assumes surface absorption only. So I must choose a solvent that will lay on the surface. So water on a starch material would be a horrible choice or on a cellulose material. I may have to use something like octane or for a very hydrophilic surface, I want to choose a hydrophobic molecule. Vice versa, something like polypropylene or polyethylene, which will dissolve uh, octane or hexane, maybe I want to use water or ethanol or something like that. So uh, just remember that I have to have the right shape of isotherm and I have to have the right absorption mechanism. If I have those things, then what I can get is a BET surface area, a monolayer capacity, and absorption constant, which is related to the heat absorption. So what's typically done is I collect an isotherm. Um, this is the uh, similar to what I showed previously. This is on a calcite. This is on a mineral material. And there is no bulk absorption for this. Um, I can apply, uh, use the uh, BET um, macro, and I will get a BET surface area. It should be linear over the range of five to 35% P over P naught or uh, percent RH. If you, you can use water, assuming that you have the right isotherm. 
Um, so I get a monolayer capacity, the C constant, which is related to heat adsorption, and a specific uh, surface area. If you want to be 100% technical in a DVS experiment, I would call these specific surface areas because they're specific to the molecule that we're using to measure the surface area. The GAB um, equation is an extension of the BET equation. The BET equation assumes a monolayer and then every other layer is the same. The GAB equation um, adds an extra term um, to um, allow for subsequent layers to have a different heat absorption than the first monolayer. So um, again, you uh, generate an isotherm. Typically, it should be a type two or type four isotherm. And I can apply the uh, macros appropriately and I will get a GAB plot. And the uh, output that I will get in the GAB gives you the monolayer capacity, uh, a C absorption constant, which is different from the BET. So it's not gonna be exactly the same, but it's related to monolayer coverage and a K constant, which is related to the multi-layer heat absorption. Again, this assumes surface absorption only. Uh, the double Freundlich isotherm is uh, typically mostly just an empirical model. Um, it does not require monolayer formation. It could be used for water absorption. It doesn't have a, any physical or theoretical basis to give you information about the absorption process. Um, it's uh, basically just an empirical model. Um, and um, it has four fit parameters because it's, um, uh, it, it, that's, it, there's a four, four, four fit model that, 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 that is applied to this particular um, application. Um, it is in the literature, so we have it in there. It's not as widely used for a, a direct application, but some people use it, so it, it, it's available. And again, you can get the, the plot with the fit, and it gives you the fit parameters. Uh, the DR stands for Duvinin Radskevich, and this is to give you micropore volume. So according to IUPAC, micropores are those less than 20 angstroms. So by a DBS experiment or a gas absorption experiment, it uh, doesn't matter if it's volumetric or gravimetric, um, I showed you a mesopore isotherm. It is possible to also measure micropores. So the micropores are anything less than 20 angstroms. Mesopores, which I'll get to later, are between 20 and 500 angstroms. Above 500 angstroms, um, the um, Pores are too large to give you any um, artifacts or effects in the isotherm, and they can't be measured by gas absorption techniques. They have to be measured by liquid absorption techniques like mercury pore symmetry or, or other methods. So um, what this micropore volume does, it gives you the volume of the pores. So this should be on a microporous material. So examples could be a channel hydrate, a zeolite, a moth, an activated carbon, or anything else where you expect the pores to be below 20 angstroms. A typical artifact of something that is microporous is you will get a very high uptake at low partial pressures. Basically, as soon as I introduce any vapor, it immediately fills those micropores, and then above that, I just have surface absorption. So here is the micropore range, Typically, that's going to be below 5, maybe 10% P over P naught. The, the pores fill very quickly. Um, and then on the desorption side, um, they may not always uh, remove. Some of those pores might hold on to the water or other vapor or gas and may not be removed. So the behavior or what you'll get is uh, something along these lines where I have a very fast uptake at low partial pressures and then almost nothing above that. Again, you can use the iso the Dabin Radskevich, and it'll give you a plot, and the output will be the total micropore volume, essentially the volume of the micropores based on the absorption of the gas and or vapor that's in those micropores. So it gives you a volume. It does not give you an indication of the size of the pores. And that leads us on to this micropore size distribution. Um, this is uh, essentially based off a T plot. It's very commonly used and applied in a wide range of absorption equipment. Um, and the output will be a micropore 
uh, basically distribution um, and also a, a micropore volume. And again, this should be used on microporous materials. So um, in this case, we have a 13X zeolite. And again, we get this similar behavior where very fast uptakes, uh, where those pores are being filled and then surface absorption from there. And um, this I can get basically, this is the average um, radius of the pores. So I get a distribution of uh, different pores and I can also get a total pore volume as well. Um, moving on to a mesopore uh, distribution. Uh, this is typically between 20 and 500 angstroms. Um, what this will show, and I'll show you an example, is typically some isotherm hysteresis in the intermediate to upper partial pressure range, and that is due to capillary condensation. Um, this is based off the classic BJH equation. It also uses a T-plot approach. Um, and the uh, output will give you the, micro, the mesopore total volume and the mesopore uh, distribution of, uh, of sizes. And in general, this is, again, on mesoporous materials, which can be metal oxides, minerals, agglomerates, um, and some other engineered materials like silica or, te or templated silicas and things like that. So what you will often get is this hysteresis uh, gap um, at intermediate to high uh, partial pressures. And this is due to the fact that um, in, uh, let me just, in these pores, so if I have a pore here, sorry for my poor drawing, um, the first layer of uh, vapor and or gas uh, can form then a second layer forms until about the third or fourth layer, typically uh, these will uh, cross and I get a, a meniscus and this is due to capillary condensation. It's harder for the vapor to uh, remove, be removed than it is when it comes on. And that's why I get this hysteresis gap. So, and again, I apply the BET equation, I mean, sorry, the, the, uh, the mesopore equation and um, then I can um, get the uh, differential plot, which will show you the distribution of, uh, of pore sizes and the total pore volume as well is, is listed here. Um, typically for both the micropore plot and the mesopore plot, you do need a reference material, something that's non-porous that has a similar chemistry. Um, and that's used as a reference in the T-plot. I won't go into details. If you have questions, we can give you some information on that. Um, the Langmuir plot um, is an, another commonly used one. I showed you previously, it's basically a type one isotherm and it shows surface absorption uh, only. And you can see here, I'm gonna repeat this example of the zeolite uh, with octane. And from this uh, uptake, it uh, shows a typical Langmuir behavior, which is basically a monolayer forms and nothing else is what it assumes. And you can see here, here is the uh, Langmuir plot. So moving on, uh, there's two other models that I'm gonna finish up with here. Um, we do have, um, I showed you at the beginning, um, kind of a laundry list of commonly used uh, models. And we have applied several of those. Um, into basically a fitting algorithm to try to find which model might have the best fit. So these are the models that are used. These are um, uh, models that have been used uh, over the literature. A lot of them are from the food industry. Um, but what this macro allows you to do is to rank the models based on which one gives you the best fit. So I take an isotherm. For instance, this is water on crystal and lactose. And I apply this. And what you'll see is when I apply it, it will rank um, over here. So the Kuhn model had the best fit that had the, the lowest least squares. The Oswin had the worst fit. So it'll rank them which one has the best fit, which one has the worst fit. And then what you can do is see here the Kuhn has a very good fit. Uh, the Freundlich, which if we go back here, the Freundlich here uh, was not very good. And you can see that here. And the reason for that is the 
uh, Kuhn model is based on the assumption, um, basically like a, something that has a type three behavior where it has a cluster formation and water on lactose behaves this way. Where in contrast, the, um, uh, the uh, proinlic isotherm is more uh, similar to a Langmuir isotherm where it has a monolayer and goes from there. So if I go back to the actual isotherm shape, we will see that this has more of a type three behavior, not a type two where I'd have this uh, sigmoidal shape. And this is why the Kuhn, which assumes a cluster formation, not a monolayer formation, fits the data better than a Freundlich, which will have a, a different type, more of a type two uh, style uh, uh, assumptions to the model. So I did mention that most of these assume surface absorption. One model that is used that does not assume surface absorption is the Young and Nelson model. Now, when we measure a water isotherm, let's say on starch or microcrystal and cellulose, all we measure is a mass uptake. We don't know if that water is on the surface, on the multilayer, or in the bulk. What this model does is it tries to deconvolute where the moisture is. Is it on the surface? Is it in the multilayer? Is it uh, in the bulk of the sample? So if I apply the Young and Nelson model, here's um, on microcrystalline cellulose or Avicel water absorption. And when I have a bulk absorption dominated mechanism, very often I will get a hysteresis gap across the entire humidity or partial pressure range. The reason for that is the moisture or vapor is harder to come out than it is to come in because as I increase the moisture, it partially dissolves and swells the polymer or the cellulose in this case. So on the desorption side, it's diffusion limited and it's harder for it to come out. And I apply the uh, Young and Nelson equation and you can see here, it breaks the isotherm down into three components. A monolayer, which is just the first layer, a multilayer, which is in red, which is essentially layer upon layer upon layer. And then the green is the absorbed, or how much is dissolved into the bulk of the sample. And this could be related to things like free water, which would be the water uh, in the multilayer range, which is free to move around, or bound water, which might be bound up or tightly bound either on the surface or in the bulk of the sample. So sometimes this can give you an indication, whereas the DVS just gives you total amount of water. This can give you an indication of maybe how mobile or accessible that water might be to other components or other constituents or packaging material or things like that. So in conclusion, I've uh, exceeded my 25 minutes, so sorry about that. Um, the DVS instruments can readily attain uh, absorption isotherms. We can do them on a wide range of gases or solvents. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of isotherm models are based off of surface adsorption dominated mechanisms. If I have an isotherm, I can then use this to extract things like surface areas, porosities, heat absorption. Um, these are typically for highly crystalline or inorganic materials that will not swell or dissolve into the solvent. When I'm talking about natural or organic or food materials, these are often bulk absorption dominated mechanisms, particularly with water. And these have very complex and dynamic behavior and are difficult to define by a single absorption mechanism. Um, the, the SMS does have an isotherm suite to help rapidly screen a wide range of isotherm models. It does not have them all. We are constantly developing. If you have ideas or suggestions for more models you'd like to see, uh, our application science team is always open to uh, expanding the functionality of this software. So um, I didn't get into other isotherm types, but hydrate, solvate, co-solvents, there's other things you can do. So in the interest of time, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my colleagues at Surface Measurement Systems and the uh, Particle Engineering Lab at uh, London Imperial College who helped uh, with some of the uh, data and slides that I showed today. If you have a 100 milligram pileup of powder, uh, which mo uh, models are reliable considering the gap form between the particles? Um, if you, um, it really should be anything. What's, what's critical and is a, a balance between uh, time and experiment is if you're at equilibrium, um, it shouldn't matter. Um, 
So if I give this mass long enough to reach equilibrium, it really shouldn't matter. I will say there's one caveat. So, you know, if I give it, it doesn't matter if I have one milligram or 100 milligrams, if I give it enough time, the vapor should find all of that material and it will reach equilibrium. Now, I will say that um, for things like um, uh, 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 proteins and other things that can go through a glassy to rubbery transition, these are kinetically controlled. So the longer I leave it there, it is possible that I could cause this transformation to occur at different times or at different humidity. So there is basically two things happening. You have a thermodynamic uh, absorption, but you also have a kinetically controlled or limited uh, phase transition um, that could be occurring. So um, I will say it can be complex um, if I'm dealing with an amorphous uh, material that's partially soluble in your, in, your, um, in your gas or vapor that you're using. In the microcellulose, is the hysteresis kinetic example, if you wait long enough for the RH to step the hysteresis, will it go away? In my experience, it'll not go away completely. Um, I've done very long experiments where I've left it there for you know a day um, at each uh, uh, humidity, and there is some real um, hysteresis, and that's due to the fact that the starting material is not the same as the ending material. If you think about it, um, the material is, is swelled, and so it's physically changing, and the void volumes are different and everything. So um, although this hysteresis gap can narrow, it typically does not go away. Now, if I did a second absorption cycle, the hysteresis gap will be narrowed, but it doesn't go away, because what happens is that the um, um, the void volumes and, and things rearrange and restructure, uh, it does get slightly smaller. So the second absorption cycle is typically up here a little bit, but does not go away completely. It's because the material is physically different. So a dry material is gonna be different than a wet material. So it's not only kinetically limited, but it can be minimized if I give it there long enough. What isotherm models would you recommend for pronounced type three data where the J shape is really exaggerated? Uh, type three. So, um, um, so here's kind of what a, what a type three. Um, if we're talking about this, uh, this here, um, off the top of my head, like I said, I believe that the Kuhn model is uh, one that will fit a uh, a type three, and that's what we see uh, here. Um, and I think the um, I have to go back and look at all of them to remember off the top of my head which um, which other ones, but it might be this uh, Hasley because this does have a good fit uh, to this as well. Um, but those are models that can be applied. Clearly the uh, GAB or the BET or the Langer models would not apply because they all assume monolayer uh, formation. Are the models exact to the pore size distribution of especially small micropores, uh, example 0.7 uh, nanometers? Uh, the limiting factor on the micropore size would be the size of the adsorbate. So um, um, the the critical the critical thing is um, on a microporous material, and um, you know I'll be uh, quite frank. Um, a microporous material. Uh, let me go to here. Um, the more data points you have at low partial pressures, the better your data will be. Now the DVS vacuum is more suited for uh, very low partial pressure steps. And if I was only interested in microporous materials, um, the DVS vacuum uh, allows us to do, you know, um, very low 0.01% RH steps, and I can get more resolution here at the lower end. Um, on a traditional uh, volumetric, um, uh, gravimetric atmospheric DVS, maybe 0.1% RH as opposed to 0.01% uh, partial pressure. So the quality of the data is going to be limited by the number of isotherm points I can get in the micropore range. And for a lot of materials, that may be required to use something like the DVS vacuum as opposed to uh, the atmospheric DVS systems. How do we get the DVS data analysis suite? Um, well, I would contact us. I mean, it, you should check. You can check. If you contact us, we can check with your original order to see if you purchased it. Um, and then we can uh, 
there's usually CDs set with the instrument, but they all get lost. IT department steal them. Um, so I would contact your local salesperson and we can look up your record to see if you purchased this. And then if you did purchase and don't have it, we can uh, supply you with a license with it and you can download it and install it. So if you didn't purchase it, then you'd have to purchase it. Uh, I, would, I would suggest talk to your local salesperson if you're interested in the isotherm uh, analysis suite. What models would you recommend for hydrated materials such as uh, MGNH 4P04.6H2O? Uh, Sorry. Uh, I, no, that's I okay. Um, well, I didn't show it here, but I do have an example. Um, and this can be somewhat tricky. Um, if I have an actual structural hydrate, so this is um, an actual stoichiometric hydrate where um, this is a, it starts out as a dihydrate. It, during the drying stage, it dehydrates. Then it forms a, a hydrate and then dehydrates. And what I can, these will often hydrate and dehydrate at different relative humidities. And what I get is I get this, um, what I'll call is like a, you know, a, a, a rectangle or very sharp hysteresis um, where I can get this. So here I have the anhydrous form. It gets to a critical relative humidity and then hydrates, and then I just get surface absorption from there, and then it dehydrates. So in reality, this material is different from this material, so I can't really use an isotherm model um, because the model assumes that the material isn't changing. Um, but what I can use, I can use this to see how stable this hydrate is. The location and the width of this hysteresis will tell me how, high, how stable or unstable or how reversible this hydrate is. You can see this one has two cycles. The second cycle is exactly the same as the first cycle. So this one, water comes in and out very easily, hydrates, dehydrates. And that's not always the case. Sometimes it'll hydrate and doesn't come out. Sometimes it, when it dehydrates, it collapses the structure of the material. But you very often get this hysteresis gap of where the hydration occurs and the dehydration occurs. Second part to that question, uh, given the dehydrated crystal already has six water molecules, is it possible to gain meaningful information using DVS of water? Um, it, if it's, if the, if the um, yeah, I mean, you can adjust uh, two things. If the material itself already has a certain number of water molecules um, in the structure, we can uh, adjust this change in mass to correlate to um, those six added water molecules and the software actually allows you to um, plot this and instead of instead of percent change in mass it can plot it versus on number of water molecules or um, a solvent to solid ratios um, second of all if it's uh, a very stable hydrate um, then uh, you can just look at the water on top one example in the pharmaceutical is lactose monohydrate it's very stable it doesn't get removed during a dvs experiment but I can still learn a lot about the water absorption on the hydrated form. Can this tool make fitting for kinetics of absorption or only the isotherm? What I showed you today was just the isotherm. Um, let me go to um, the DVS uh, software. Um, we do have in our, this was our, our isotherm uh, suite. Um, the isotherm is just looking at the isotherm. Um, there are models, and we do have things to look at diffusion kinetics um, and other uh, kinetically limited. So if I want to measure the rate of uh, absorption, uh, we have a simple Fickian 1, 1D uh, diffusion kinetics uh, and also permeability. So we can look at both diffusion and permeability in films or powders or fibers or things like that. So what I showed today and talked today was focused on the isotherms, but certainly we can use the kinetic information um, so for instance, looking here, um, we can fit these uh, slopes uh, to different models to try to deconvolute the diffusion or the kinetic or dynamic information. Does water isotherm uh, imply porosity of the sample? Water isotherm? Um, uh, not, not directly. I mean, um, the shape and the behavior of the isotherm could give us some indication if the material is porous or not. Um, you can use water molecules um, for porosity measurements. Um, again, these would be typically on rigid materials, um, but there's nothing in the model in terms of the mesopore or micropore model 
that says you have to use a certain gas and or vapor. I can use water certainly to obtain um, both uh, mesopore and micropore uh, size distributions and, and, and volumes. Uh, there's nothing in the, in the models that requires it to be a particular vapor. Um, it just has to be um, the right type of isotherm uh, and the right system for it to be used. Can I apply any of these models if my materials are amorphous and uh, recrystallized during the water sorption process? That's going to be that's going to be difficult um, um, because once it recrystallizes, again, the material has changed. So your material at the beginning is different than your material at the end. Um, so um, the isotherm model is assuming that the that, that the material isn't changing. So the only thing you could do is if, for instance, let's say uh, not in this example, but let's say that the material recrystallized at 70 or above 70% RH, you can, in these uh, isotherm models, put in the limits. I can only fit the data. Let's say I don't, I don't want to use the entire isotherm, but I, want, by, by, I only want to use the, the data from zero to 60% relative humidity. Then I can certainly use all of these models. So in all of these, um, um, let's say, all of these models, we, you can put in specific upper and lower RH or partial pressure limits. So if it recrystallizes at a high humidity, I can still use the isotherm models at a lower humidity below that point. What model would you recommend for porous polymers fully and not fully cross-linked? Um, for porous pol polymers, I mean, in my experience, um, polymers are, could be porous, but they're not going to be uh, meso or microporous. They're typically macroporous, which is larger than 500 angstroms, which unfortunately we can't measure those. Uh, we can't measure, we can't quantify the porosity. Um, we certainly can measure an isotherm um, and it can give us some valid information, but it's not going to give you porosity. Um, I could be wrong. There, I'm sure there's examples where uh, polymer or amorphous materials are, are mesoporous, but most of the time meso and microporosity are for things like silicas, aluminas, uh, activated carbon, zeolites, uh, and things like that. Why, his, uh, hi, why hysteresis uh, loop sometimes is closed at P over P naught uh, equals 0. 0.6 or 7, or 0. 0.7, and sometimes at P over P naught equals 0. Uh, 0. 0.4? Sure. I mean, um, th this hysteresis, um, let me go down. It, it all depends on the mechanism, and that's actually gives us a lot of information. Um, so, for instance, in this one, the hysteresis closes at like 60%, and that's because I have a capillary condensation. Now, I could have multiple things happening. So, I could have a sample that's um, both um, mesoporous, where I'd get a hysteresis gap here, and microporous, where I might get a hysteresis gap here as well. Um, if I look at something like, let me go down. Um, on a um, starch or a cellulose-based material, very often the hysteresis gap is across the entire humidity range because the sample is diffusion limited across the entire humidity range. So it really is a function of both the vapor and the sample and how that vapor is interacting with the sample. So, um, and there's no reason why I couldn't have multiple things that happen, especially in a composite that might have a, more than one material. Um, I could have something that's partially crystalline, or I could have, you know, Avicel along with, um, you know, an API that forms a stoichiometric hydrate, and I can get all sorts of complex things that happen. All right, so we are going to be answering the last few questions, um, and then we're going to wrap everything up. So uh, one of the last questions, and then there's there's one more after this one. Okay. Um, which models are ideal for a 13X and 4A zeolite characterization, surface area, um, et cetera? Yeah, for, for the zeolite models, I mean, they're typically microporous. So things like the Langmuir isotherm, um, the, um, um, uh, the micropore, um, or the Devine, the Devine Radskevich gives you micropore volume. Um, the uh, micropore T-plot can give you some information there. Um, the Langmuir isotherm would apply uh, to that as well. Um, I mean, one thing to note when you're dealing with microporous materi materials, um, 
very often in uh, the B, if you want to if you want to use the BET uh, model for microporous materials, um, uh, very often for microporous materials, you have to be very careful um, about the range in P over P naught that you use. Um, if I want to uh, get not use this very sharp uh, uptake for microporous materials like moths and zeolites. If I do it over the entire range, I'll get a negative uh, C constant. What people typically do is they bump up this lower limit, maybe not 0.05, maybe 0.1, maybe 0.15. They keep increasing this upper limit until the C constant is positive. It's not physically possible based on the uh, assumptions of the BET equation to get a negative C constant. So if I apply the BET equation to a microporous material, and I, got a, I get a negative C constant, that's this C term here, then what I would recommend is that you increase this lower limit and um, until it becomes positive. And that's typically what people in the nitrogen or gas absorption uh, uh, areas do on microporous materials as well. Okay, so we have uh, two more questions and then okay. we're going to have to um, end this uh, session, but, um, feel free to ask uh, us questions after this webinar um, at science at surface measurement systems. Um, right, I'm just gonna say that you can email us at science at surface measurement systems with anything else uh, after the fact, but go ahead, Brad. Um, what are the reasons for hysteresis at the microporous level when measured with the water as a probe molecule? That is purely a kinetic uh, a limitation, uh, typically, um, is because the uh, the um, water, as I, as I mentioned, um, maybe I can get to it um, uh, here. Let me just go down, sorry. Um, that's a kinetic limitation. Um, so for instance, it just takes a really, really long time to get out of those micropores. Um, and very often I might have to use temperature to get it out fast enough. So in theory, if I left it there long enough, um, this should go down and the water should come out. Um, but it is a very uh, slow and kinetically limited process to get all of the vapor or water out of a microporous material. And for the last and final question, can you please mention a couple of sample for natural porous material along with their application? Ah, <sighs> naturally porous materials. Um, Sorry, that's a, that's a bit um, uh, daunting for me to think of right off the top of my head. But um, um, I mean, I can do I can do a search and, and see what some of our customers are using this uh, uh, for. But I mean, um, certainly, you know, there are some cellulose space. There's some um, uh, spray dried and freeze dried uh, materials that are porous. They they form uh, like little spheres that can be highly porous. Um, so. In particular, spray drying um, uh, to uh, on some uh, polymeric or naturally based uh, materials like um, you know there's some technosphere and there's some other technology that's out there that different companies have developed as as carrier molecules um, in pharmaceutics um, to make them porous. Um, so it really would typically depend on the process uh, to make them uh, either a controlled or not controlled porosity. All right, I believe that concludes today's webinar. I wanna thank everyone for uh, attending today. Um, if you have any further questions, please email us at science at surface measurement systems or contact um, your local sales rep and they would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, or if you wanna do some research on your own, um, visit us at surface measurement systems.com. Um, we look forward to seeing um, all the attendees at future webinars, and I want to um, thank you again for all attending. Thank you. Have a good day.